Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord God, you entrusted this spiritual service of holy chrismation to your divine apostles, and you commanded them to baptize the world in fire and in spirit. May it be administered through us sinners to this soul who prepares for holy chrismation. Adorn them with the gifts of your Holy Spirit, and then they will offer glory and praise to you, to your blessed Father, and to your living and Holy Spirit, now and forever. May we be worthy to offer praise, thanksgiving, worship, exaltation, and honor to the Holy One who gives holiness to the sanctifying mysteries and who exalts the sacramental ministries. To the high priest who showed us the way of purification by first cleansing himself in the waters of the Jordan, and led us on the path of life to redeem us from our sins. To the good one our due glory and honor at this time, and at all times, celebrations, hours and days of our lives, now and forever. charity you became flesh in a wondrous manner born of the blessed virgin you offered us to your gracious father for adoption as his children through water and the spirit you fashioned children in their mother's wombs yet you willingly became a child in order to renew the image of Adam, aged and corrupted by sin. You renewed him by the holy and spiritual fire of the baptismal furnace. Although you did not need to be baptized, you came to its waters in order to sanctify the waters of the Jordan. O Son of the Majesty on high, you bowed your head before John the Baptizer. The Father proclaimed and thundered from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit of holiness came down in the form of a dove, and rested upon your head while the spiritual powers stood watching in awe and trembling. Now, O Lord God, extend the right hand of your mercy upon your hand servants who are prepared for holy chrismation. Sanctify, purify, and cleanse them through your forgiving his soul. Bless and protect your people and your inheritance. You have clothed us through your baptism with the robe of glory and with the seal of the holy and life-giving spirit and you called us to be spiritual children in the second birth of holy and forgiving baptism. So now enable us by your victorious power and with the confidence of beloved children to glorify you with joyous faces 
your Father who sent you to redeem us, and your holy and living Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy are you, O God. In your bounty, you will by the saints and who live and abide in them with the dwelling of divinity sanctify our bodies souls and minds through the descent and the action of your holy and divine spirit and make them the dwelling of your divinity purify our hearts by the hyssop of your mercy Enlighten our darkened minds by the abundance of your clemency. Gather our spirits and our thoughts away from the corrupting errors of this world filled with despair. And then we will think, adore, and glorify you for your mercy toward us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Saw 
The sea beheld and fled, the Jordan turned back. The depths were also troubled, and the clouds poured forth water. <clears throat> A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul, who proclaimed the words of the four corners of the universe. May his prayer be a tower of protection for this place and for all her inhabitants. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery so that you will not become wise in your own estimation. A hardening has come upon Israel in part until the full number of the Gentiles comes in, and thus all Israel will be saved as it is written. The Deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away godlessness from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. In respect to the gospel, they are your enemies on your account. But in respect to election, they are beloved because of the patriarchs. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you once disobeyed God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now disobeyed in order that by virtue of the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God delivered all to disobedience that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how inscrutable are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given him anything that he may be repaid? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over the vast Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Amen. 
remain silent O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Apostle Matthew writes, And the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus approached and he said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end of this age. This is the truth, peace be with you. of the riches of God. Inscrutable are his ways. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So we can ask the question with this reading today from the Romans, what does it mean to have faith? Not faith in the theological sense specifically. That, of course, is very easy in the sense that it is grace that moves the will and illuminates the mind, so we make a sense of the revelation of God. But the consideration is what does faith actually mean in the largest sense? And of course, faith from that point of view actually means trust or confidence. When you, you send your two-year-old, you send your, your second graders off to school, you have a confidence that they're to be, to be instructed in something. The children have trust. And teachers, of course, dispose things so that children can actually learn, because you can't learn for them, of course. So you go into that second grade classroom, and there's bulletin boards, and there's colors, and there's an alphabet over the chalkboard. There's all the things surrounding beauty to dispose the little ones to learn. But also, they cannot learn unless they have trust confidence. This is why as our culture disintegrates and there's fewer and fewer sane and healthy homes, the children themselves live in fear and terror and depression. They're not disposed to learn, so hence the grades go down, we now graduate functional illiterates. Everything is really extraordinary. But it goes back to the original question. In order to have faith means to be open to actually learn something. This is why St. Paul in the epistle today uses the term disobedience. When we use the term disobedience today, it means you broke the law. You didn't do what you were told to do. Bad, bad, bad. But that's not really what the word disobedience means. Disobedience means the ability to hear. We've often talked about this in the Latin. It's the Latin word, ob audire. Audire, you know, because you know the word audio. Audio in Latin, literally the word means I hear. A-U-D-I-O, I hear, audio. And ob is something placed in front. So ob, audire, means I hear what is going on in front of me. And that is a learned skill. I mean, how many people, especially when you talk to children, you're telling them something, you're instructing them, and they're going, uh-huh, and at the same time turning and walking away from you in the middle of the sentence. 
because they think they already got it. And of course, inevitably, they don't get it, they mess up and they do something wrong. So when we speak about obedience, obedience is the ability to hear. So when St. Paul talks in this epistle today, he is speaking about the ability to learn. When we have that trust and the ability to hear, what we're doing is we're actually opening our minds and our spirits to learn something. And I don't know about you, but my intention until the day that I teeter over into the grave is to continually be learning. I have a ridiculous number of books in my house. The seminarians used to make fun of it and say someday we're going to find Father Doran dead in his office under a pile of books because they will have crushed him to death. But it's because there is always more to know. There's always more, not in a speculative sense, but the world is filled with wonder and beauty, even on a natural level. And to sit there slack-jawed and drooling in front of a screen and just scrolling for hours and hours and hours, there's not a lot of learning going on. We were joking at the barbecue and talking to one of the families, because my sermons are long. Because of course, sermons are only supposed to be five minutes these days. But I told them, yeah, so I go 15, 20 minutes. I said, but in the 90s, in the 1990s, the sermons were always a half an hour. Now, we don't do that now because I've become more merciful. I'm not merciful, right? You know me. <clears throat> but it was because in the 1990s, people actually had an attention span where they could listen to a beginning and a middle and an end and listen for half an hour. Now our attention spans are down to, you know, seconds. And it's a shame because we've all become those two-year-olds. Uh-huh, roll your eyes and turning around and walking away while the person's still talking. This is tragic because ultimately when you link it together with the supernatural order, this is a question of salvation. If we can't hear one another, if we can't listen on a natural level, if we can't be open to learning on a natural level, then with even more reason, we're that much farther away from learning in the supernatural level. And that touches our salvation in eternity. And that is tragic. So it's not just simply to wring our hands and say we are producing functional illiterates. That's bad enough. But we're actually forming generations now of people who do not have the ears of the Spirit to hear anything from the voice of God. This is profoundly distressing because ultimately it means damnation when we cannot hear the voice of God. This is what St. Paul is talking about in this chapter 11 to the Romans. Because as we've mentioned before, the Romans have asked this question, well, if for 15 centuries, if for over a thousand, almost 2,000 years, God prepared a people in the Mediterranean basin to receive the Messiah, and when the Messiah arrives, though there are thousands of them who do recognize him as the Messiah, Israel as a whole refuses and rejects the Messiah. It's important to understand that when we talk about Christianity and Judaism, there is one thing that separates us. And that is the question of whether or not Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. That is what has divided around our Lord in the gospel, and it's what's divided in those first two centuries, so that by the time you reach the year 200, everything you recognize about modern-day Judaism and modern-day Christianity is completely fixed by that point after two centuries of development with the coming of the Messiah. But it's precisely the arrival of the Messiah coming in the place that shatters that aspect because you have to respond. When the second grader coming from the broken home who lives in fear and probably isn't even being fed at home, who knows now, with all the needs that we have, that child is not disposed to hear, no matter how beautiful that second grade room may be and how considerate and understanding that second grade teacher is, the child cannot learn because of the lack of disposition. 
So what St. Paul is winding up talking about is this, when he, he uses the term disobedience. That yes, Israel is in the state of disobedience. They have rejected the Messiah. But because they still wait for the Messiah, the fathers of the church go on, they are actually preparing the way for the Antichrist. Because the only people who care about Christ are Jews and Christians. It doesn't mean anything to a Hindu. Kind of means something to Islam because Islam is like a mishmash of Judaism and Christianity from the seventh century. So they pick up bits and pieces. But the notion of the Messiah, the Savior, is very clearly coming out of the old law. So St. Paul says to the Romans, you yourself once, you pagans, your background is paganism. Your ancestors, you yourself personally, perhaps, some of these people, you worshipped rocks. You worshipped statues. You worshipped the power of the air. You worshipped the wind. You worshipped the water. You worshipped the stars. You, for a time, he says, were in disobedience. For centuries, the pagan peoples of the earth, the non-Israel, you were in disobedience. You were not listening. You were not learning. You were not receiving God's teaching because God taught everybody. God is teaching everyone at every moment, baptized or not, with the hopes of leading them towards their baptism and their chrismation. That is the purpose to lead them into the fullness of life, which is so beautifully portrayed in the Husoyo today. And he says, but yes, Israel herself is now in disobedience by having rejected the Messiah. But he says, God has brought this about so that all of mankind has fallen into disobedience, so that no one can vaunt themselves before God and say, I'm fine, I'm good to go, I'm a nice person but to realize that they have been closed to learning from the voice of God. So that's why St. Paul, when he's talking here in this section, again, you need to read chapter 10 and chapter 11 for him to see this. But he's talking about this cosmic vision of the redemption of mankind. We know that on Judgment Day, whenever it takes place, the day that our Lord appears in full glory, we have no idea who will be the nations of the earth. We have no idea what those states and societies will be called. But we do know that there will be, in, in among human race, we know there will be two recognizable entities on that day. In the midst of everything else that we have no way of knowing politically. We know that there will be a people that will be recognized as being the church, the body of Christ. Large numbers, small numbers, doesn't matter. They'll still be recognized as being the church of God. And you will have descendants of the people of Israel that will also be recognized as Israel. All the rest will be whatever's happened between now and then politically, socially, culturally, ethnically. But on the day that our Lord appears in his full manifestation, the day of judgment, there will be Israelites that will be recognizable and there will be the church, the body of Christ, that will be recognizable with the successor of Peter, with a priesthood, and with all the baptized members. As we said, it may not be very many. It may be a hundred people who have all been rounded up and exiled by the Antichrist to a South Pacific island. But you will still have a priesthood there. You will still have the divine mysteries. You will still have the baptized body of Christ. They may be running around naked and in loincloths in their imprisonment, but they will still be the body of Christ. But you will also have the Jews who will at that point have converted. Because this is what the fathers say. Because Judaism, as we know it today, has rejected the Messiah, they prepare for the Messiah to come, the expectation. And so the fathers say that when, that, when an individual comes that they will recognize as Messiah, he will be precisely the anti-Messiah, the anti-Christ. 
And Israel will affiliate all of its power, all of its intelligence, all of the gifts that God gives in such abundance to the descendants of Israel. Because you know that. They are the people in your college classes who kept screwing up the grading curve because they're always pulling out the 98%. You know them. And God has lavished his choices upon them. There's no reason not to say so. And that they have resurrected in a historical 20th century, a language long dead before, never used but now as a national language of Hebrew, this is an extraordinary thing. We don't think about the things that continually go on. But St. Paul says that these people then, they will become, the fathers of the church interpreting St. Paul, that they will become disillusioned with this man of iniquity, as St. Paul calls him, and they will shift away from the false Messiah to the true Messiah. And St. Paul says that when that happens, what will it be except nothing short of the resurrection of the dead? It's in this same letter. And this extraordinary vision is cosmic, universal. This is about the history of the human race. The human race is not governed by economics and politics and all these things. The human race's history is about sin and virtue and redemption. That's its story from beginning until end. And it will be cataclysmic in the end, especially around the people who have not been hearing in their disobedience, the people of Israel. But in their conversion, there will be a transformation of the human race as they receive the Messiah on that day, fulfilling God's original plan from the beginning. This is why when St. Paul comes to this section in the letter to the Romans, you've heard it said, so when he says, so who are, what is Israel? He says, because of the gospel, they're the enemies of God because they reject the Messiah. They reject the good news. They reject the gospel. He says, but, in the same sentence, but because of the election, God's choices, God's providence, God's calling, he says in the epistle today, and because of the patriarchs, because of the fathers, they are beloved. So Israel is this great mystery. And the reason why Israel, not the political country, but that the people of it, there's always been Jews, and there will always be Jews. That they are there not because of political or cultural reasons, they are there for a theological reason. Just why in the Middle Ages you have in the art forms, in poetry, the story of the wandering Jew. Some of you may have a plant in your house called the wandering Jew. Those kind of purplish things. It comes from this medieval epic story, which is actually a poetic and artistic form describing this theological reality of Israel that we're not familiar with any longer. But in the Middle Ages, they were aware. They were aware about Israel. They were aware about the Jews, which is why your largest ghetto of Jews was in Rome until the 20th century, because the popes gave them refuge when all the other countries were throwing them out. They've always been around. And the story of the wandering Jew, they give him a name, Lazarus, because you're waiting for the resurrection from the dead. But the story is very simple that all the artists and poets will take up is that during our Lord's carrying the cross, his crucifixion, that as going down these alleyways, that at one point he stumbles under the cross and he puts his hand up against one of the buildings to support himself. And the Jewish merchant who owns that building, who owns that shop, comes out in the doorway and tells him to get off of his building. And part of this rejection and it stood that our Lord looked at this Jewish merchant and said, because you gave me no rest in my need, you shall have no rest until I return. And this man never dies. And he continues generation after generation waiting, waiting, waiting for the Messiah. So this is a poetic form, an artistic form 
that is throughout the Middle Ages, they'll speak about this, but what they're doing is echoing St. Paul's letter to the Romans. So all of this is to say, why is it that we quote this for the Feast of the Holy Trinity? It's because at the end of this chapter, when St. Paul looks at this absolutely extraordinary vision of the theological reality of the human race, that he is so overwhelmed by the majesty of what God has worked out. And we can even do it 2,000 years later with much more depth and much more appreciation that he simply goes into this magnificent triune doxology, the riches of the abundance of the mercy of God, the depths of his way, the wisdom of God, how inscrutable are his ways that God should do these things to bring about. So it's from him and by him and for him that all things have come into existence. It is this literary prostration before the hidden God of majesty talking about this great mystery. But so that the Romans don't get smug, St. Paul says that these things will take place, he says today, after the fall, after the apostasy of the nations. So this vision is that the gospel that arrives in the world in the rejection of the Messiah, this gospel spreads to all the other nations, which has always been the intent. But Israel was meant to be the heralds of this gospel to the world. That was the original program. And instead Israel goes into its disobedience, rejects the Messiah as a people. And that gospel spreads. And St. Paul says that gospel will spread throughout all of the world in history. But there will come a point where the, the nations themselves will apostatize from the gospel. He calls it the fullness of the nations. You're living through that now. You're watching Europe and North America apostatize. North Africa, the Middle East, they used to all be thoroughly Christian countries. Are they so now? Not by any stretch of the imagination. And Europe at one time was Catholic. Is it now? Not by any stretch of the imagination. But the gospel continues to spread throughout Africa and throughout Asia now. And when we come to fulfillment and all the nations have received the gospel and fallen back into disobedience, then will the moment when the Christ comes to bundle everyone up into his mercy. This is an absolutely spectacular epistle. So I encourage you to read it. We kept it for the Sunday today because it is wonderfully connected with chrismation. Because chrismation is just essentially the metaphysical transformation of the spirit of an individual to open the ears of the spirit to the voice of the, to, to the ears of their spirit to the voice of the divine spirit that they may learn and enter more deeply into that gospel. So may the Lord God bring us all obedience to learn how to listen to what he places in front of us so that we may be transfigured and made holy as the children of God. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
We stand. O Christ our God, you came into this world and made baptism to be like a mother who brings forth spiritual children unto life eternal. We beseech you. O Christ our God, through your holy baptism, you sanctify the waters of the Jordan and all waters. You promise the kingdom and new life to those who descend into it. Receive baptism and confess your holy name. We beseech you. O Christ our God, through your spirit of holiness, you came to cast fire upon the earth. Through your spirit you illumine the hearts and strengthen the spirits of those who proclaim your divinity and cherish your holy name. We beseech you. O Lord, answer us. Alleluia. The prophet cries out, the daughter of the king stood with splendor and the queen on her right side in great glory. Baptism is the daughter of the king, and the church is the faithful queen. The church descended to be baptized and was adorned by baptism. She received the groom who betrothed her as a pledge. O Lord, receive our baptism.
Isaac, servant of God, is sealed in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Oh, 
Especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Onephrios. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the repose of Joe and Selzin. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. on page 835, 835. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Almighty Father, you are true and only love. 
May we be bound by your divine love and find joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. Peace. peace. <clears throat> Lord God, we bow before you and ask that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God, the Father, maker of all creation. With your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. By his saving passion, he restored us to our original life. He gave us life by his divine blood. Kuri eleison, wabiyamo hadaktam hashodi lema bedhaye, and sabe lachma mida kodi shoto ubarachu kodesh. Waxonia bin Talmita, Karo Mara, Sabahula Mene Kuluku, Hono Denita, Fahro Dil, Dahlo Faikun, Wachlov Sagi, Metafaseo Metihem, Husoyon. How may we hold on to the light? How can we hold on to the light? How can we hold on to the light? Ya bil talmita karomar sabishta wa mene kulhu 
Whenever you observe these commandments, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. Jesus Christ, we remember your plan of salvation for us, your conception, birth, and baptism, your saving passion, and life-giving death, your burial, your glorious resurrection, and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kindness and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, we your sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them we praise you we bless you we adore you we glorify you we confess our faith in you and we ask you have compassion on us O God we descend in time to the Father and the Father and the Father and you perfect us as well with the abundance of your grace and make us chosen vessels of your service. Manin monio, manin monio, manin monio, ni te moro rojo chayo korisho, on achen alain u al korbono uno. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the honor of building and strengthening of your holy church and the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Exalt your holy church established throughout the world. Protect your shepherds of the true faith and peace and security all the days of their lives. Especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. 
Bring back those who have strayed, that they may live in your fear, and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace, and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so that they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers and a companion to travelers. Grant your eternal reward to monks, to those who live solitary lives, and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in the caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen the archdeacon and first martyr, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, Saint Onofrios, and all the saints. May we join their ranks and share in their joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to the rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysius, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, and it is without sin. We hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Render us, O God, to the departed. us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, it is now and shall be forever. God the Father, 
you are merciful and compassionate. You have sanctified this divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory, and the glory. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el Amen. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance, who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory.
Again and again, we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
O oh God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him, glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Shlomo el Kodukunna. O Lord God, magnificent and fearsome, you grant forgiveness of sins to those who are born by baptism, through water and the Spirit. You bestow a new birth upon those corrupted by sin. You raise up those who have fallen. You shield those who come close to you. O Lord, enlighten the hearts of your servants, Sharbel, Raphael and Rafka, who have just received the sacred chrismation, as you have enabled them to become sons and da daughter and sons of your grace, in your merciful kindness keep them firmly in the ranks of your children. Grant, O Lord, that after being purified by the waters of your covenant, they may be, be members of a royal priesthood a holy nation, a redeemed people, and a blessed community. May they not put aside with the visible robe of their bodies the invisible and hidden robe, which is you, our Messiah. Rather be for them, O Lord God, an invisible and incorruptible robe, so that they may be strong against the desires of error and invincible before evil spirits. Confirm, O Lord, these your servants in the holiness of soul and body. Perfect them by the grace of the spirit of holiness. Establish them in the paths of your living commandments, so that they may be worthy to cherish your adoption and inherit your heavenly kingdom. It is fitting for you, O Lord, to show compassion, to redeem, and to save all those who turn to you, our Lord, O Lord, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to you be glory forever. So there are festivities downstairs, I remember to announce, and you're all welcome to come down with the family. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. I leave you in peace. I hope that you can have to return to you.